what I wanted to be. I thought I could be on life's sinking sand, but Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Is it Mike? Yes, sir. Mike, I went to North Greenville College. Uh huh, I sure did. Years ago. Thank you so much for the privilege of being with you today. And uh, it's, it's great to be here. I was at Calvary for 10 years. Years ago, about 19 years ago, our last church was in Rome, Georgia. Uh, we were there 12 years, and during that time, I buried 170 people. And so I can do a funeral really well, <laughs> almost without thinking. But um, it is so great to be here this morning. Let's pray before we get started, okay? Dear God, we thank you so much for your goodness and mercy, your grace that is always enough for whatever we go through. Lord, thank you that whatever comes our way, we know you're not surprised by it. Lord, whatever happens in our country or across the waters, Lord, we know you're not surprised. And Lord, we know that you reign, that you're over all, you're in control. And so Lord, help us not to worry or fret, but help us to trust you knowing the end of the story that we've already read in the book of Revelation. That one of these days very soon that the Lord Jesus will be revealed in all of his glory and splendor. 
And we'll be caught up with him in the heavens to be with our loved ones and friends who preceded us in Christ. Lord, thank you for every person that's here today. And I pray, Lord, that you'd open our hearts to hear the word of God today and not just be hearers of it, but to be doers of it as well. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, does anybody know what happened December the 7th, 1941? Pearl Harbor. That's exactly right. That's when the Japanese planes flew in and bombed Pearl Harbor. And today you can go there and you can find the, the, uh, the battleship Arizona and hundreds of our sailors that have been entombed uh, for all these years in, in that ship. But you know that the United States contributed to, to that bombing because we had made a deal with Japan several years before that we would send millions of tons of sheet metal to Japan. And with some of that sheet metal, they made the planes that bombed us. 2001, the Taliban in, Af in Afghanistan had an over-the-shoulder missile launcher where one man could use that missile launcher to detect the gases emitting from a helicopter or a plane, and it would target that and would shoot them down. They, they pushed Russia out of Afghanistan with those missile launchers. Guess where they got them from? Our own CIA. Two weeks ago today, our troops were thrust from Afghanistan, leaving millions of dollars of helicopters, um, tanks, AK-47s, all the weaponry that the Taliban would need. Folks, did you know that it's never a good idea to send your enemy the weapons that will shoot you down? Did you know that it's never a good idea to send over to the enemy, whoever your enemy may be, weaponry that they can use to sink you? And folks, did you know that we have only one enemy? And it's not the Taliban. Amen. It's not even Washington, D.C. Our, our one enemy, and, it, and it's not even the person sitting next to you. <laughs> it, our one enemy is the devil, is Satan. And Satan wants to shoot you down. He wants to shoot me down. And in fact, of all the people in churches today that he wants to shoot down, guess who the number one target is on? The pastor of the church. Because he knows if he can shoot the pastor of the church down, that he can get the church down. I think really COVID has, uh, is terrible. But one thing that it has done for us as churches is it has gotten us to think outside of our Baptist boxes. It has gotten us to think, how can we reach people who will never come inside these buildings? Did you know that most lost people will never come inside here? And Jesus never told us to invite people into a building so a preacher could preach to them and win them to Christ. What did he tell us to do? To go out where they are. You know, I've been fishing a lot of times with my dad over the years, many years ago. And he would always say, Dale, you, you can't catch fish on the bank. You've got to go where the fish are. And so we've got to go out, don't we, into the highways and hedges and compel them to come. Well, when a person comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the devil no longer has possession of them. Before that point, he is their father. But after they come to know Christ as Lord and Savior, the devil cannot have them anymore. He cannot possess them anymore. But once he has you, and hopefully you're in the family of God today through Jesus, once he has you, once the Lord has you, the devil still wants to shoot you down. He still wants to defeat you and get you useless in the kingdom of God. He still wants to rob you of your influence as a child of God. Now, she's a nurse, and I don't know what a lot of you do. Some of you are retired but still real busy. 
Whatever you do, you are really a Christian disguised as a nurse or whatever you do. But the devil wants you to hand him ammunition so he can shoot you down and keep you from being an influence for the kingdom of God. So we got to keep him from doing that, don't we? Oh, he's called by a lot of names. He's called by the devil. He's called by Satan. The devil actually means one who slanders or accuses. Uh, the word Satan means one who stands against you, an adversary. Uh, he's also the deceiver in the Bible. He's Abaddon in the, in the book of Revelation. He's called by all these names, but... The bottom line is, he is the destroyer of mankind. The first thing he wanted to do was dethrone God and enthrone himself. Well, God kicked him out of heaven, so now what does he want to do? He wants you to dethrone Christ as Lord of your life. But I want to let you know, even though Satan is terrible, and he is our adversary, he's our enemy, he is a defeated foe. He was defeated at the cross. Yes. He, God prophesied that in Genesis 3.15 where he said that he shall crush your head. He was talking about the cross. And then 1 John tells us that Jesus on the cross defeated the acts of Satan. And so all the plans of Satan went down the tube when Jesus died on the cross and came back to life again. You know... I wanted to tell you one of the most cruel things my dad ever did to me when I was growing up. Do y'all remember those little chickens, the little chicks that you bought at Easter? I know you don't. That were born, you, you bought them at Easter and they were colored. They were dyed. They dipped them in dye. Well, I bought one one Easter and it was a green little chicken. And I raised it from being a chick into a full-blown chicken. So I'll never forget the day that my dad said, Dale... Go out in the backyard and chop your head off of your chicken because we're having it for supper. I, I was horrified. I didn't want to eat my chicken I had raised from a chick, but I did what my daddy said. Got a hatchet and chopped its head off. And what surprised me so much was the chicken ran around the backyard without a head. And he ran and he, she ran or he or she, whatever it was, Ran around and around and around. Did you know the devil is exactly the same way? At the cross of Christ, the devil was beheaded. And you wonder, okay, if the devil was defeated at the cross, why does he bother me so much today and every day? It is because he is headless and powerless except from delegated authority from God, permissive authority, but he is still running around in the backyard wrecking havoc and trying to ruin us. But we've, we've got to be careful not to pass ammunition to him that will shoot us down. Now I want us to look in our Bibles this morning to, to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. I don't care if you've got a, you're looking it up on the cell phone or on your paper copy. You know, I am... I'm of the age I still love paper copies, and I do read the Bible from my, com my computer sometimes and from my phone sometimes, but there's nothing like holding the pages of the Word, is there? 1 Peter chapter 5, let's begin with verse 5. Likewise, you younger men, be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, because he doesn't care about you. Is that what it says? No, because he cares about you. Be sober, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings that are being experienced by your brothers in the world, now the God of all grace, who, has, who called you to the, his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will personally restore, establish, strengthen, 
and support you after you have suffered a little. To him be the dominion forever. Amen. I want you to keep your Bibles open because you're going to need to jot down a few things. If, uh, get in the habit of taking notes, okay? I used to have a deacon who sat near the front of the church building, and he would say, Pastor Dale, I, I am having such a hard time because during your sermons, I fall asleep nearly every Sunday. And I said, I'll tell you a solution. Get you a piece of paper and get you a pen and take notes on every sermon and you'll never fall asleep. And I never saw him sleep through another sermon. And so take notes. Write some things down. I've got three words this morning I want to share with you. Three main points that begin with A. I mean, how, how much simpler can that be? Three things we can send the devil, our enemy, to use to shoot us down. Now, the first one is attitude. Attitude. Now, what does he talk about in this first part of the passage? He talks about the attitude of what? Find it there. Of pride. Pride. Pride is thinking you're something you're not. Pride is thinking, God, I can handle this. I don't really need you. Pride is an attitude of thinking that you're better than others. Pride is an attitude that, that leaves your Bible on the coffee table and says, God, I really don't need to read it today because I've got this. Pride is the attitude that, that doesn't pray because I don't have time, I'm busy, I've got a lot to do today. Folks, you're too busy not to pray and read the Bible. I remember there was a boxer during the early 80s. His name was James Tillis. They called him Quick, Quick Tillis. And he, he was from Oklahoma, and he moved to Chicago to box for a living. So he said, I got off the bus in Chicago, had my two suitcases under my arms, and I stood in front of the Sears Tower, and I put my suitcases down, looked up at the Sears Tower, and he thought to himself, he said, I'm going to conquer you, Chicago. And he looked down, and his suitcases were gone. See, pride, the attitude of pride, when you send those, those kind of attitudes to the devil, he will cause you to sink every time. Now, he talks about several things here that pride can cause, that attitude. And one is rebellion against authority. Rebellion against authority can be in the church. You know, I, I've, I've known a lot of people through the years in the churches that I've pastored who will not follow the pastor's leadership. Now, am I always saying that the pastor's always right? No. But God has, has selected the pastor as the leader of the church. And if he's wrong, guess who's going to correct him? God is. And it's not our responsibility to correct him unless he's doing something that will hurt the church or hurt the community. God will do that. Now what about a parent and a child? Well, God has placed the parent over the child and the child needs to recognize that authority. Did you notice the word that he uses here two or three times? He uses the word elder. And so he, he, he implies there may be a problem sometimes with people looking at someone who is older than they are, who is wiser than they are, and refusing to respect authority. Folks, did you realize that we're living in a day that does not respect authority? Go to the school system and see how hard school teachers have it today. I try, when we lived in Williamston, I was a substitute teacher for two times. And I said, I refuse to do this anymore because I'm going to end up in prison. I'm going to kill somebody. And it ain't going to be me. It's going to be one of them. And so two times is all I could take. There was no respect for substitute teachers. Y'all know that. There's no respect for authority, no respect for policemen today, no respect for the badge, 
no respect for the government, no respect for anything. But for the child of God, he says, my attitude of pride, which results in disrespect for authority, whether it's at church, at school, at home, in the government, whatever it is, can send ammo to the enemy that will shoot me down. All you have to do is look at Peter. I mean, Peter, uh, when Jesus was going to wash his feet, he said, hey, you'll never wash my feet. He said, well, you'll never have fellowship with me then. Because that was a picture of cleansing daily dirt from your feet. Spiritual dirt. And then, he, then later Peter said, hey, I'll never deny you. Hey, don't ever say never. Because he did. And so that's what rebellion against authority can lead to. Now, here's another thing that he talks about. And that is resistance toward instruction. Because the word elder tells us, you know, there are three words in the Bible for pastor. One of them is elder. One of them is pastor. And the other is what? Wanda, can you think of it? Because I can't think of it right this second. <laughs> pastor. Elder, and I'll think of the other one later. I'll let you know. How about that? Maybe tonight. Who knows? But resistance toward instruction, that's what he's implying. We need to be learners of truth. We need every day, we need to pick up this book and get into it. I have a little thing that I do every day of the week. It's called H E A R T. And I. I go to a passage of scripture, one or two chapters every day, and I, the, the word stands for highlight one or two verses, explain it in your own words, apply it to your life, respond in prayer, and then find something you can tell somebody about, about that passage. And so I use that as my Bible journaling every day, and it's helped me so much to get deeper in the word. In order to be instructed by the word, we've got to get into this book and into prayer, and then we've got to apply it to our lives. I love what Dwight L. Moody used to say. He used to say, let the, 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 cup, the leather of the Bible become your shoe leather. In other words, live it out, practice it. Folks, did you realize that most of us know more of the Bible than we'll ever be able to apply to our lives already? I mean, I've been a Christian since I was nine years old. And I'm 66. I mean, I've heard the Bible preached. I've preached it myself. I know a lot more than I'll ever do. You say, well, why do we need to keep coming to church then? It's because we're not doing what we, what we know. We need to start teaching others. You got, do you have children? Do you have grandchildren? Is there a child living next door to you that doesn't have a daddy? Well, God has just given you an assignment. To start passing on what you've learned all these years to other people. And mentor or disciple them in Christ. And so we, we don't need to resist instruction, do we? Um, things I look at. Things I listen to. I can pass those things on to Satan with this attitude of pride. Not listening to the word that he can use to shoot me down. What about that uncontrolled temper that I have? I can pass that over to Satan and he can use it later to shoot me down. I mean, that, folks, there's a lot of filth on television. You'll have to admit. There's more filth on television and on the internet and on your cell phone that you have access to day and night than ever before in history. And the devil would love nothing more than us filling our minds and hearts with that trash. And there's a lot of good things on there too. But with a lot of trash that he can use later to shoot us down with. And so that's why we need to get into the word, into prayer, and instruct our hearts to be renewed every day. Choices I make. Choices you make as a teenager... 
will come, will, the, the God will use or the devil will use to shoot, the devil will use to shoot you down with later if they're wrong choices. God will use to build your character up later. All right, let's look at another thing he talks about. He said, this attitude of pride can cause resentment toward servanthood. He says, um, humble yourselves. Be clothed with humility. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Did you know that the very word humility or humble means to put on an apron? I don't know. Some of y'all know what an apron is, don't you? I think Red Skelton said about his wife, he said, my wife always said, I want to, I want to go on a vacation to somewhere I haven't been in a long time. He said, well, go to the kitchen. <laughs> and so I remember my mother always wore an apron. She was a real servant. And that's what the word humility means. It means to serve, to learn to serve. I remember we had a custodian years ago in a former church and I was listening and I wasn't intending to listen to what he said, but a member of the church came to him and said, could you do this for me? And I'll never forget what he said. He said to that member, he said, that's not on my job description. I said to him, come here a minute, come here a minute. Don't ever, 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 ever say that to any member or anybody ever again because whatever you're asked to do as far as cleaning this building, that's your job. It's on your job description. It may be in the fine print at the bottom, whatever else I'm asked to do, but it's in your job description. Guess what? If you're a child of God serving is on your job description. Serving the Lord Jesus, serving others. One of the most miserable persons I have ever met in my life came to a former church and sat on the back row and I went to talk to him after the service. He said, I have just stopped going to my church. I've given up everything at the church. I'm burned out. I'm tired of it. I'm not serving anymore. And I looked at him and I said, you're the most miserable person I've ever seen. He said, tell me about it. He said, I am miserable. I said, don't wait too long to start serving again. Get, get a little bit of rest, but renew your heart. Get into the Word and in prayer and get back to your church and start serving once again. With an attitude of pride, I say, oh, they've got enough people serving down there. They don't need me. In fact, I'm too big for that church. And so I'm, I'm not going to serve down there even if they ask me. Those are, that's ammunition we're sending to the enemy to shoot us down. Let's learn to serve. All right? Y'all ready to move to the second point? <laughs> I'm going to hurry through these next two, I promise you. What was the first ammunition we can send to the enemy? Attitude of pride. Look at the second one anxiety anxiety he says it in the last part of ver or verse 7 he says casting all your care upon him because he cares about you what's he talking about he's talking about don't worry don't be anxious don't have anxiety don't watch the evening news if you want to have anxiety, if you want to have fear, watch a lot of news. I don't care if it's CNN or Fox. If you watch that all the time, you're going to have anxiety. Right. And so I don't watch a lot of it. I watch enough news on, on my phone, and I watch a little news on the television, and I said, all right, that's enough. Turn it to another channel because we've had enough of it. I've heard this same news four times today, and I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to be more anxious. What you need to do every day is get a sheet of paper out, and at the very top of the page, put worry list. Write down everything you're worried about. Then after you get through, go back to the top of the page, mark out worry, and put prayer list. 
Isn't that what the Bible says? Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. And so anxiety, worry, in fact, the word worry or anxiety means to, de- to pull yourself apart. It pulls us apart. And it, all it is is sending ammunition to the enemy to get me to panic instead of to trust God. Now, you say, well, I do that. I, I don't worry much. I'll worry about something, and then about two days later, I'll take it back. Then I'll give it to God, and I'll leave it a few days, and I'll, I'll give it, I'll take it back. All right, if you've had a car who, that's had some trouble, and it comes up on the dash, check engine, like I've recently had, you've got one of two choices. You can, get, you can, you can do, go do something about it, or you can put some duct tape over the check engine light. I chose to take mine to a mechanic. And guess what I did? When they told me what was wrong with it, I didn't bring it right back home and say, ah, it's nothing. And every time I'd see it, check engine, check engine, check engine, and I would be anxious about it. Guess what I did? I took it to the mechanic, and I left it there until he fixed it, and then I brought it back home. Do you know what we do? We take our issues and problems there, our anxieties there to God, and then we take them right back before they're fixed. God said, cast all those things, and it it means once and for all. Cast all your cares upon Him because He doesn't care anything about you. Is that what it says? Because He cares about everything person so when i'm anxious and i panic over everything that's going on around me around in my life in my among my children my grandchildren i'm sending ammunition to satan to shoot me down later all right you ready for the third one i told you i was going to quickly go over that second one the third one is this my response to adversity My response to adversity. He says that in the next two verses. Be sober, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, the one who is standing against you, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him firm in the faith, knowing that the same suffering are being experienced by your brothers in the world. He's talking about suffering. All right, look at the near the last of the next verse. He says, after you've suffered a little, Christ will personally restore, establish, and strengthen, and support you. So he's talking about adversity, trouble. How many of you have ever experienced trouble? Raise your hand. You're either going to experience trouble, you're in the midst of trouble, or you're exiting out of trouble. But this life that is under the curse of sin, we will always experience physical issues, marital issues, financial issues, parental issues, you name it, it's there. Life is probably 1% of what happens to you and me and 99% of how I respond to it. That's what he's talking about. He says, my response to the the adversity, the suffering of life, whether it comes from persecution or from just daily trouble, is the difference between not sending ammunition to the devil to use against me or sending it there. My adversity, my response to that. Now notice verse 10, he says, now the God of all grace. I love that, don't you? The God of all grace. That means variegated. It means a variety. Women, do you have a diamond on? Just turn it over and and look at it just for a minute if you've got one on. A diamond. Okay? 
Some of you are doing it. Some of you are not. Whatever. Or you got the diamond, and it's multifaceted, isn't it? It's got a lot of different cuts to it, doesn't it? That's what the word variegated or variety means. In the book of James, it said, James wrote to us and said, Rejoice in the variegated, in the variety of problems or troubles that you have. When y'all, can I get an amen that we have a variety of problems <laughs> that come in our lives every day? So we got a variety of uh, just multifaceted number of problems. But here he says, he is the God of all grace, which is the same word. It, it means variegated, variety, multifaceted. And so every problem that you and I have, God in his grace is able to meet that problem with his grace. You say, well, I've been praying for years and he hadn't solved the problem I've been praying about. Let me tell you, George Mueller prayed for 65 years for a lost friend to be saved. All of his whole prayer time that he prayed for that friend, that friend was never saved. George Mueller died and was buried, and at the graveside, that friend of his he had prayed for for 65 years was standing there by the grave and gave his heart to Christ. So don't give up. Don't give up. The multifaceted grace of God can meet any multifaceted problem that you're in the midst of. But it is my response to those issues that make the difference. Problems can give us greater opportunities of ministry. Some have been through divorce. You didn't really understand what, was, what divorce was about before you went through one. But now, since you've been through that, God is going to use that to help other divorcees. You've never had cancer before until recently. You got cancer. You've had surgery, perhaps. You never knew exactly what that was all about until you had it and got through that or maybe still going through it. But you know other people who have it and now you're able to sympathize with them, pray with them more effectively. And so God uses problems to, to increase our influence and opportunities of ministry to grow us up. To give us a sense of dependence on Him. All those things. And so, I want my attitude to be right, don't you? I want it to be one of humility. I want to be teachable. I don't want to be filled with anxiety. And believe me, we retired a year ago, February. And guess what happened a few days or a few weeks later? COVID hit. And so when we retired, everybody retired. We had all these grandiose plans of going on trips and, and seeing our children in South Carolina and all these things. We couldn't go anywhere. We went to Lowe's because everybody else was there. And Walmart where everybody else was. We were all masked up and everything, but but I had some anxiety during that time because I'd been a pastor for 40 years and now I wasn't anymore. But we can't be anxious about anything. We can't panic about what we're going through. We've got to trust God that He knows best because He made us. He knows our address. He knows our phone number. He knows where we are in all of our situations. And then adversity. Adversity. We need to respond rightly to adversity so we won't send ammunition to the devil. You know, I've seen plenty of mu magicians. And magicians or illusionists, what they will try to do is get you to look over here while they're doing something over there. They will misdirect you so you will miss the, the illusion that they're trying to create. They will get you to look over here while they're doing something over there. And when you finally look over there, hey, it's different. It's, 
Is it, he's a real magician. No, he's not. He just got you to look over there when you should have been looking over here. See, that's what the devil does. He uses misdirection. He will get you to look at yourself, pride, the attitude of pride. He will get you anxious. He will get you thinking about your situation and how terrible it is. Or he'll get you focused on the suffering you're going through and get your eyes off of Jesus. You see, the devil can conquer you. The devil can conquer in your situation, but the devil can't conquer Jesus. And so I've got to keep my eyes on Jesus. And if I do, I'm not handing ammunition to the devil. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me?